uh, some, I don't know, weird game as well that you can play via your like smartphone where you draw pictures and people have to guess it and stuff too. Nice. It was uh, interesting. All right, I'm showing 7.30 on the dot right here. So I think to, we'll start on time. Uh, we're recording it. Folks can always catch up later, but uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. I'm showing we have um, 189 particip 190 participants right now. So I think this might be a record for uh, a Mountaineers Zoom conference. And we just thought that given we're, we're all stuck inside and no place to go, that we would at least talk about climbing and get folks excited for when we can go out climbing again. And uh, hopefully that's not too far off in the future, but it's important we stay home right now and uh, don't overload the medical systems and stuff too. So appreciate everybody doing their part and, and joining in in solidarity, at least here to, uh, to hear about climbing. A um, couple things we're going to do here. So we'll cover some quick Zoom guidelines. We'll talk a little bit about the Mountaineers just for a second. Gavin and I will do a brief intro. And then we're gonna cover some things about uh, the route on Liberty Ridge on Mount Rainier. When's a good time to go on this route? The permits you need, the physical prep, the gear, some resources you can, you can uh, look at after this for more info. We'll also share a story from when Gavin and I climbed this in 2013 which uh, incidentally was the same day that Tom Vogel climbed it. And I think I saw Tom was on the call at least uh, earlier. And so we'll share a little of that story. Uh, a quick disclaimer here, as everyone should know, climbing is dangerous. So uh, this is not an instruction manual, but this is meant to be giving you uh, good information so that you can go off and, uh, and learn more, seek appropriate guidance and make your own judgment decisions. In terms of Zoom, like this is the first time we've done a beta and bruise via Zoom. I just kind of put it out there as uh, I was willing to give it a try and see how it goes. So we're testing it out. Uh, I've muted everybody and uh, I think people have the ability to unmute themselves, but uh, if, it, if we run into issues, I can, I can mute everybody again, I think. And what we're going to do is kind of just keep yourself on mute. You can turn off your camera, save the bandwidth. Uh, we're gonna record this for future use. And you can type questions into the chat window and we'll try and get to them as we go. Gavin and Sky will monitor that. And we'll also do uh, just Q&A at the end in general. And then afterwards, everyone that's registered through the Mountaineer site should get a post-event feedback form. It would be awesome if you could provide feedback via that so that we can uh, improve our kind of beta and bruise series uh, if we try and do more of these via Zoom in the future since this is our first go in that format. All right, so the Mountaineers, for those of you who don't know, because I think we've ex we probably put this on a couple of different places and this is open to the general public who wanted to register for it, was founded in 1906, so more than 100 years old. We ha currently have over 14,000 members with branches in seven locations, Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, Bellingham, Everett, Foothills, and the Kitsap Peninsula. The 501c3, we are funded by our members, course fees and donations, uh, and a bit of uh, donations also includes grants. And as everyone is aware, the Mountaineers has not been uh, running any activities for the last several weeks. You can even see in the screenshot here, uh, you know, canceled, canceled, canceled. So we are doing uh, no in-person activities to try and do our part to help flatten the curve. And one of the implications that it's had on the organization is uh, a significant impact on the revenues uh, for the organization as well. So we have had to cancel all courses or nearly all courses, I should say, uh, offering refunds to those students. Um, we also had to postpone our gala. Right now we are actually running a, a virtual gala online where there are some auction items and some experiences and some really funny videos. There's a video from Jim Whitaker, uh, first American on Everest, and the uh, first CEO of REI as well on there today. And I think there was one from me yesterday or the day before, and then one from Tom Vogel. So there's a series of funny videos in there and some great auction items. But if you're able to consider making a donation, uh, even if you're gonna make one later in the year, maybe at the end of, end of the, the annual fiscal year, you do your taxes and you, know, you try and do your donations then, it would be awesome if you could pull it forward this year, given the, uh, the cash flow circumstances and the impact that has on staff and, and the community here. 
Uh, I included in the chat window a link to a YouTube video that Gavin and I pulled together from the Liberty Ridge climb. So for those that joined early, it's just under seven minutes. You may have watched that while we were waiting here to queue up, but uh, feel free to take a look. If you also check out my channel, there's other videos there from Waterfall Ice Climbing, one with Gavin as well when we did not Banff. Uh, there's other Seven Summits climbs and things like that. So just more fun for uh, keeping the stoke high while we're stuck inside. All right, let's see if this video plays here. Just give you a sense of the conditions up high on the route on our day. We had uh, up to 70 mile an hour winds that day. And about 12 pitches of ice climbing. You can see the shine. All the snow is in we had goggles that day. A quick intro from me and then I'll hand it over to Gavin. Uh, my name is Vic Sani. I am the, the current board president of the Mountaineers and I started alpine climbing in 2002. I took a six-day glacier mountaineering course with Alpine Ascents, got hooked on it and uh, went on to take the Mountaineers intermediate course. I have my wilderness first responder. I've completed the seven summits. I did that in January 2011. The, uh, the bottom left picture uh, is a, you can actually see me in the picture. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in Zoom, but that's me right there with a white backpack on, on the uh, the knife edge traverse approaching the Hillary Step on Everest, and then the bottom right is me on Vinson Massif in Antarctica. Uh, I've done Rainier 15 times and via four routes. I think it might have been 13 at the time that we did Liberty Ridge, and. Uh, now I'm, I'm doing a lot less of the big climbs, but uh, occasional water ice, try to get out there once a year up in Canada, and some trail runs, which I was inspired to by Gavin, and he'll tell you more about that in a minute, and Trad Rock, but I'll uh, hand it over to Gavin. Cool, thanks Vic. Hey, uh, good evening everybody. I just wanted to echo what Vic said, you know, glad we could uh, do this, even though we're, um, you know, yeah, keep the stoke alive a little bit while we're um, quarantined here at home. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's been crazy because, you know, one of the things that, you know, I just absolutely love about Seattle is, um, that we can just go outside, you know, really on our front steps and, 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 you know, get in the mountains. Um, but, um, now we really just have to do it from our front steps, <laughs> no driving. So, um, you know, I know we're all in this together, trying to, trying to flatten the curve. So yeah, so you know a little bit about me. Um, I like probably a lot of you. I was a um, came up to Seattle really for adventure and uh, moved up from California back in um, kind of early two thousand eight. And my um, fiance at the time, Sarah, and I climbed Rainier with the guide service and got hooked. And then we um, said, hey, how can we do this, you know, ourselves on the weekends? And so we um, heard about the Mountaineers, joined up, and got really into it. So took basic and intermediate. And then um, actually volunteered to help out more and became board president. And uh, later on, roped uh, uh, Vic in. Uh, so I'm um, excited to have him um, leading the, leading the, the uh, organization now, which is very exciting. Um, and I um, all, uh, after I uh, finished his, my Mountaineers uh, board president, moved over to um, NWAC. And so I've been uh, part of the Northwest Avalanche Center for a couple of years. So if you're not uh, part of that organization and um, rely on the avalanche forecast like um, like I do, um, I'd uh, you know recommend checking uh, that out because um, it's also um, you know a donation based um, organization to keep that forecast alive. In terms of just my kind of adventure stuff, you know, been fortunate to yeah, I've climbed Rainier a lot and all the other volcanoes around here, and then really kind of blend in my love of. Um, uh, skiing and then long distance running <clears throat> by doing some stuff uh, like the Rainier Infinity Loop where we, um, a partner and I climbed the mountain a couple of times and then um, and ran around it around the Wonderland Trail essentially. And then um, a bunch of other things like Barkley Marathons and picture up in the upper right is uh, Badwater. Um, so yeah, I just like to get outside and test the limits. 
And so um, test, speaking of testing limits, what's really testing limits now is being at home with two young kids, four and seven, uh, who have a lot of energy. And uh, so we've been uh, spending a lot of time with those guys, obviously. So yeah, so that's a bit about me. And um, so I think we can move over to the next slide. And so I was going to take this first section to give you guys kind of a rundown of, of the general route. Um, and then we'll go through kind of how the climb unfolded for Vic and I. And so you see that, you know, the um, route was climbed back in 1935. And it's it's a very serious route, right? Grade, grade four. Um, but also, it's very condition dependent. I mean, people have skied, skied um, uh, Liberty Ridge, um, you know, in, in good conditions, it's possible. Um, but it's also one of these things, and you'll, you know, I'll just say it right away, is that, you know, normally the crux of the climb is the, uh, the Bergstrand, um, and that's two pitches of ice typically. And um, for us, it was actually fair, fairly straightforward uh, because we just climbed, I don't know, probably 10 pitches of ice before that. And it actually, you know, kind of let up. We could actually kind of walk around it. Um, so um, we actually, yeah, had a lot of, a lot of ice climbing on it. So, and it is a, a, a carryover. I mean, you could descend the route, but, you know, you've already seen the video just how steep it is. And so it, it's very committing. And, you know, as most of you probably know, that it's, you know, been the, um, the place of, of a lot of accidents. Um, uh, you know, every couple of years, something, you know, bad happens up there. And so it's very serious. And so that's why, you know, hopefully we'll give you kind of an idea of, you know, the preparation that we had prior to tackling, you know, big objective lists. And so just, you know, we'll go through more of the detail of kind of the route here, but, but generally we get over here on the, off the Carbon Glacier, climb up here to Thumb Rock, and that's where, you know, there's a, a handful of bivy sites essentially. And then up through a couple of different options um, up to really where it gets steep here into this Black Pyramid section, and then the Bergtrend in this area, topping out at Liberty Cap. Whereas um, uh, the true summit is, is over here, and the Emmons comes around uh, this side. Probably can't see my cursor though. That's no. the problem. Um, so, uh, but yeah, if you can, if you can work with me there, Vic. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's good for this slide. Um, just as far as the overview. And then we have another visual here. So again, coming from White River, um, moving across uh, the Winthrop Glacier to um, St. Elmo's Pass. Then um, what we did is we uh, spent the night actually on the Carbon Glacier. Um, oh, actually, sorry, we oh, stayed the night. Yeah, went there. There we go. And um, <coughs> excuse me. Then the next day, um, moved out um, across the Carbon, then to our bivy site at Thumb Rock, which is the second pyramid there, and then uh, or triangle, and then um, up to the summit, and then we went down. Um, the Emmons. We actually did not go to Columbia Crest because we were um, pretty much tuckered out from uh, <laughs> from so much uh, front pointing and uh, actually spent the night at Camp Sherman. We intended not, we intended to just go out that night, but ended up um, just being there at Camp Sherman, which we'll talk about as we get into it. So I think that's good. So yeah, so as Vic said, we climbed in early June. We had clear weather, but unexpectedly very high winds. I mean, with some gusts so strong that actually we crawled, once we got up to Columbia Crest, we crawled to the very top uh, just because it was so windy. We were expecting a couple of pitches of ice. I'm glad we threw in you know, a few extra ice screws because we definitely needed them. Uh, because even though, and you'll see in the pictures, the Climbing isn't super steep. It was um, steep enough, and the and the uh, snow was just crappy enough, or ice was just crappy enough, and the wind was just very disconcerting. You know, we didn't want to get knocked off our feet. You'll see in the pictures that some other folks were just simul climbing, but we felt like we just for safety uh, we wanted to pitch it out. So yeah, we started Friday um, at White River. <clears throat> um, went to Thumb Rock on Saturday. Sunday, we, yeah, I guess, left at 2 a.m., so early, early day, and um, didn't get to Sherman until 10 p.m. We bivvied uh, just for a few hours, and then we got back to cart 8 a.m. Um, on, uh, on Monday. Um, luckily, I had my spot device, 
And uh, I don't know if there were even really um, the uh, in-reaches at the time where we sent actually two-way messages, but I had a pre-planned spot message on my on there just saying if I hit a button, then my wife, basically saying we're running late, my wife knew to call my boss and say that I wasn't going to make my Monday morning meeting. So I think we move on to the next one. Yeah, so just some pictures here. So just, you know, this is just a visual representation of what we just talked about. This is heading up from White River. You can see the mountain peeking out through uh, there in the background. Yep. Then we um, moved up to St. Elmo's Pass. So pretty easy. St. Elmo's Pass, and then you get a cool view that a lot of people actually, you know, don't really see. If they're just going up the Emmons, they, they probably wouldn't go up, um, you know, over to check it out but we get over onto the carbon and so kind of where our tracks i guess i don't know we bivied pretty close um uh to where um you know once we got over the pass uh, pretty straightforward and then next slide yeah and then we um i guess we did have some wind that night that's why we built up the you know the walls and uh settled in for a few hours of sleep so then I think it might be time to hand it back over yeah, sure. to Vic. Yeah, and I think one, one of the things I remember, Gavin, we had two conversations going into this. One was, you know, obviously looking at the weather on a regular basis because we saw that the forecast was for pretty high winds. And, you know, we had the reservations and otherwise the weather looked good. And so we thought, well, let's go. We'll check it out. We can at least head over, take a look. And if it gets too windy, then we'll stop and we'll come back. So that was one of the things that we thought about. Another conversation that we had ahead of time was about um, who's going to lead the ice pitches. Uh, because we thought, oh, there's only going to be two pitches of ice. And uh, I think there's two, two schools of thought here, and I'm not sure which one we were coming from at the time, which was, uh, uh, you know, ooh, I don't want to lead them. Do you want to lead them? You know, is one thinking. The other thinking is, heck yeah, I want to lead those ice pitches, so I want to make sure I claim them type of thing. So I don't recall where we were coming from, but I remember having that conversation. And, uh, and then it turned out that it didn't matter what we said because there was so much, so much ice that we all got plenty of time to climb it. <laughs> so in terms of when to go, this is the, the typical Liberty Ridge season is usually after the White River Park entrance opens. Uh, I think if you, you can hike in early and but that can be like an extra 12 or something miles each way, I think is what I remember reading. Uh, I'm sure there are people who've done it um, and done it on skis during the middle of winter potentially as well. Uh, I'm not one of those people, but uh, I'm sure there are. And the other is that people typically go before the carbon glacier is getting too crevassed. So it tends to break up fairly early season and you'll see some pictures of the lower crevasses there that open up. And the second is when the ridge gets too hard to access. So the carbon can, can kind of pull away from the ridge. And you'll see later in some of our pictures, the kind of loose rock um, and kind of mud slope we had to go up to get onto the ridge proper. So June, kind of mid, late May, early June is, is kind of the peak season for it. The National Park Service now has a route guide for Liberty Ridge. So if you go to their website, you can pull up a PDF that, that has a ton of really good data on it. And that came out after we had done the climb. Uh, but it kind of gives you a lot of the stats on it. So it's really important to have good weather for this climb. A lot of the weather moves in from the other side of the mountain. And so you could be on this, there's stories of people being on this side of the mountain, progressing upwards, not realizing the storm is building on the other side of the mountain, getting up on top into a total whiteout. And then because you're descending a different route, you know, especially pre-GPS, and not, if you don't have a track of the recent um, Emmons Glacier descent, not just like last year's Emmons descent, but a recent Emmons descent, you may be completely uh, hosed in trying to get off the mountain. So that's why this can be such a committing climb and why so many people run into issues on this climb. I think then one thing I was just gonna mention is, I think we had a number of weekends kind of, you know, planned out that we could go. Um, yeah. So that's also a thing just to have, have the flexibility because what you don't, because, it is so committing. You don't want to have to just box yourself in to say, we can only go one weekend. So, you know, give yourself flex options and then go when it, you're actually going to maximize the chance for success. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I've had on my other Rainier trips where I have been boxed into a weekend because I'm, 
you know, leading a climb for a, for a group or something, that's typically when we get, you know, bad weather and we end up going to high camp and then just turning around. And I think I've, I've probably done that four times or something like that where I've gone down and it's been a rainstorm or you know, it's been some other thing that people still want to like kind of get out and stretch the legs and you've reserved the weekend and so you end up just going up and you never know the weather could clear but uh yeah important to have alternates in terms of permits now you can get your climbing pass uh online so you can just go onto the website from the national park service and there's a link to go do that um you do need your wilderness camping permit just like you would if you're gonna to go to Muir or any of the other places in the high camps. So you can go onto the, the National Park Service spot for that. For the Liberty Ridge side, the number of permits when we were doing it, and I don't know if they've revised the, the number recently, it was only 12 to 16 people were allowed in the entire Carbon River um, Glacier Zone. And so that includes Liberty Ridge, Curtis Ridge, Ptarmigan Ridge. And Liberty is the most popular, I would say, but Tarmigen is, is it supposed to be an amazing route as well, and it's on my list of ones to do. So highly encourage people to, uh, to get permits and to do reservations in advance. And be sure you're checking the, the National Park Service website for all the latest info on that, as well as the Climbing Rangers blog spot, which has the latest climbing conditions. Here we are heading out from our camp on uh, day two, crossing the Winthrop Glacier. And uh, it was pretty easy walking in the beginning. You see a, a boot pack from some people who'd gone out in the prior couple days. And this is now we've descended onto the Carbon Glacier. And this is the ridge right in the center of the screen, that kind of dirt line with uh, Thumb Rock being right here roughly. And then the top of the mountain being in a little bit of a cloud right now. But you can see how broken up it is already here. And you actually descend from the Winthrop over a little ridge to get down onto the, the carbon. And so it's a little tricky to figure out exactly the best place to drop onto it right there. And then you start to see, this is the you know early June, I think, season. And you can see how broken it up, it up it is already. And you can imagine having to route find through this. Thankfully, you do get a bit of a uh, elevated view onto the glacier before you go down. So if you have clear weather, you can kind of plan out a little bit of your route. And again, we were lucky that there were some people that had done the route uh, the weekend prior in several groups. So there was a, a bit of a boot pack that we could kind of follow that largely was you know, highly likely to still be good. So as you approach, this is uh, the carbon glacier down here. And then this is the ridge proper. The way we went up onto it was uh, once you reached kind of where the toe of Liberty Ridge hits the carbon, we went up on the right hand side slightly, uh, somewhere up in here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, up into here and then up onto the ridge proper and then towards Thumb Rock. And it's a pretty amazing spot because it's a very active avalanche zone. Y you can see Serac Fall coming off the Willis Wall or off the Liberty Wall here, off to either side. Um, so there's, you could probably find on YouTube a bunch of great videos people have shot of the action you can see from the Thumb Rock camp. So us just headed up. You can see we were, we were both hiking with like a whippet in one hand, so a trekking pole with an ice axe top on it. Meandering through some of the crevasses on the carbon as we're approaching the ridge. And coming up to the very bottom of the ridge and you start to enter a rock fall zone here. And then here we are, and this is another team behind this team of three, coming up the roughly the same way we were coming up uh, on this kind of dirty snow to get onto the ridge proper. And then in a little bit of a rock scramble on some uh, questionable rock here until we kind of gain the ridge proper below Thumb Rock. So at Thumb Rock is where we uh, pitched camp. And uh, it's about 10,700 feet right here. And you can see there's a couple different variations uh, depending on the conditions. And so you may have a, you may go to the left, which I believe is what we did. Um, in the center, there can be a waterfall grade three, waterfall ice grade three, kind of like, I think it's only like a 20 foot or less uh, pitch uh, up in the center, or you can walk around on the right. Um, I think the, the left side 
at least when we went that way, felt like the safest to me because you have a little bit of shielding uh, while you're in that place right there of, you get exposed to maybe the rock from the, from right directly above you, but you're a little bit protected from Serac fall or other things that could come from above. Whereas if you were on the right side, I think you have a bit more exposure. So this was our, uh, our kind of camp spot and uh, it was super windy here as well. So kind of in the 40 plus miles an hour and you can see a lot of walls built up around the tents and things like that from the party next to us as well. I'll let Gavin take over here on this one. Yeah, thanks. Oh, and somebody had mentioned in the chat, it looks like Alex's phone um, may, may have some background noise. So Vic, I don't know if you- Oh yeah, I can take care of that here maybe in a second. All, All right, right. The power of the Zoom. All right. Um, yeah, so we got up, you know, uh, after pitching the tent and stuff and, you know, Vic said, hey, what's that on your face? And I didn't even know I got hit by some rock, which is not surprising because there was just, it's just total junk um, as we navigated, you know, getting onto the ridge. Um, so that was, um, you know, a little bit exciting. The other thing that's not represented in these pictures is Vic, when we started cooking dinner, I don't know if you remember this, Vic, um, but your like, you know, dehydrated meal, whatever your mountain house, you open it up and put water in it or whatever, oh, and yeah. it was totally bad. And yeah, so like, had to totally, yeah, it had gone bad. So we had like one meal, you know, we were already packed in light. So, you know, we ate some whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then I had to carry the like excess weight of a hydrated bad. That's right. Dried meal up. Yeah. I don't even know how it went bad. It was, it was like it had been opened previously, but it hadn't, you know, type of thing. It's probably sitting in the bottom of your pack, you know, over like 20 trips and getting here. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so so we had a little bit of excitement there at the, at the tent. And then, um, yeah, we'll play the video here. What you can't hear me saying is it's windy. So yeah, so we're looking up Thumb Rock. Or that, that was just Thumb Rock, and then um, now we're looking up the mountain. And again, those different variations that Vic was talking about. So we went up the left side, and there's the Willis Wall. And yeah, that thing is just shedding stuff constantly. And uh, so it's, it's just an amazing position. And uh, we had built up, just because it had been so windy, built up um, these shelters. And you can see a few other people you know, were there, a few other parties. And I forget what the limit is, but it's, you know, just a handful of folks because there's not much um, you know, good space there. One party had just dug in and uh, they just built a, built a snow cave, which it's actually not a bad idea. I mean, you know, you take, by the time, you know, we built those walls up and, um, you know, got the tent all situated, you know, it might have been just as quick to, to actually just, you know, bury, you know, dig a, dig a, a, a cave. Um, but it actually, <clears throat> the wind, even with those um, walls, we actually ripped the, the side out of the, uh, one of the um, stake points out of the tent. And uh, so that was a bummer. Luckily, uh, Black Diamond, they sent it back to Black Diamond. They gave, just gave me a new one. So that was nice of them. So good customer service. Um, yeah, so then, uh, as Vic said, we got up at two in the morning. Um, and so um, we did not have this view. Um, in fact, you know, I don't remember, you know, I mean, you know, the first part, hours of the climb, you know, it was all in the dark. Uh, but yeah, like Vic said, I think we went up the, the left variation here. And um, so now you can see um, that, so the view here would be where, where that WI3 is. We would be on the back side of that as we ascend up to the, um, that black uh, triangle there, which is really where the three routes re-merge. And then it's hard to say when we really, when it became light and we started kind of being able to see things, but, but somewhere between where the, <laughs> the, the red line does not appear there, uh, somewhere in there. And then it started getting steep and um, pulled out both, um, both tools and, and started going up. Um, actually, before we get off this slide here, um, I just wanted to keep going on the, on the route. So you can see the bird shrunned at the, uh, towards the top there. Again, that's really the crux of the route. 
And you can see that it is, you know, probably, I don't know, a thousand feet below the summit, maybe 1500 feet. So, you know, that's also what makes this difficult is because, you know, that trun can be complicated depending on, again, conditions and you're doing it, you know, after you've gotten up, you know, super early in the morning and had a long climb and you're at altitude. So again, just what makes this, you know, such a challenging but cool route. So yeah, then we can move to um, what is now when the sun started coming up. So we were already, you know, probably a couple thousand feet up on the route. And uh, yeah, just gorgeous. Um, Vic uh, took, took this pitch here. So you can see, you know, big packs, I think 40 pounds. You know, we tried to go as light as possible, but you know, tent, sleeping bag, Etc. And I'm glad we brought goggles because you'll, you know, as you already saw, that was pretty critical because we had a lot of, um, you know, is uh, not even spin drift, just actually ice chunks coming down onto us as we uh, as we ascended. So then next slide. Yeah. So yeah, what do you need to <laughs> do to, get to to do this? Yeah, get in good shape. But what does that actually mean? So next slide. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I always talk about just time in the saddle, you know, just, um, you know, it's one thing to be, you know, fit and be a great runner or climb, you know, or um, skier or whatever, but just, you know, mountaineering, as you all know, is just its own animal. And it's not necessarily just about being physically prepared, but, you know, what happens you know, if, oh, you lose a glove, like, do you have a backup pair of gloves? You know, things like that, just good mountaineering sense. You know, this is not the time to figure it out. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Rainy or Baker Hood are, are, are great options. Um, my first kind of, you know, ice route, alpine ice route was Baker Northridge, which I highly suggest because it's got kind of, you know, all the elements, but at a smaller scale. So that's a great option. And then, yeah, we're lucky, we, you know, once uh, we all can get out of the house, you know, we've got lots of great options with mailbox. And this is Vic and I um, doing a, a mailbox at climb here. And so, uh, yeah, we're lucky because we've got a great uh, playground around here. And then next. Yeah, so, you know, this is in, um, well, you know, pro you know, maybe 1,000 feet below or 500 feet below the Serac, you can see the other parties ahead of us, some that were um, uh, just simul climbing. But like I said, we had decided to pitch this out. Then next. Yeah, and you know, it's a cool position. You drop something here and it lands like 5,000 feet below. Yeah, so you definitely is, don't want to slip. Yeah, you do not want to slip here. And yeah, so here's, you know, the, the setup and, you know, this is a pretty good view of kind of, you know, the conditions that we faced, like it wasn't just, you know, just sheet ice, but, you know, you'd get in some positions where, um, you know, it was, you know, super solid where you could really get good screw placement and other places it was, you know, pretty crappy, which then you could really kick some good steps in and take a little bit of, you know, um, pressure off the front points, but, you know, but yeah, it was, it was fun, fun climbing. At the same time, you can see that, Gavin, you know, your, your axes aren't buried that deep either in the tips. So it's still pretty hard surface that you're on at that point. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So then, yeah. So then Vic, you can take Yeah, I'll one. take it from here. Sure. So in terms of gear, uh, I mean, obviously if you're thinking about doing Liberty Ridge, you've probably done Mount Rainier before. Uh, or you just moved to Seattle and you happen to be like a really good climber already. Um, so you'll need your normal Rainier setup for, and for a team of two, uh, this is some of the, the gear we'd recommend. So we took a 60 meter rope, uh, depending on if you got really good recent condition reports, you can obviously vary this. Uh, but we took, I think on the order of eight ice screws when we were there and we, I think we had three pickets, maybe four, um, two ice tools. You don't want a, it's not a waterfall ice technical tool. It's more of um, an alpine ice. So it can be a bit straighter shafted. You saw in the picture of my tools, they were straight shafted and they had um, wrist leashes on them, which I found really nice because 
you didn't have to worry about you know grip strength and holding on when you're with your heavy pack and other things you can just you got the leashes you can put, put some of their weight into the leashes themselves um, versus a technical water ice tool or something like that um, you do still want to make sure that you can sink the shaft in because you're coming up on the lower portion and you still want to be able to have a you know a functional general mountaineering tool so you could always bring one technical and one more general um, we didn't need flotation for when we went in, but uh, some of the reports from like a week or two prior to ours, maybe the people putting in the first boot pack, um, you know, did have conditions where I think snowshoes might have been helpful for them. But of course, you're going up and over the top, so you're going to have to carry it. Um, I have seen some trip reports, maybe on Cascade Climber or elsewhere that talked about people skiing it. So that's, a, that's an option for some people. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome skiing, I'm sure. So you gotta be a really good skier to do that because it's pretty clear it's a no-fall zone the whole way down. Uh, extra food and fuel. And then we each had a, so Gavin had a, had a spot, I think, and I had a PLV at the time. Now we each carry an inReach always whenever we're out. Um, you know, even when I go out solo running or something like that, if I'm gonna be out of cell phone coverage, I'll for sure have an inReach with me. So highly recommend that. And the whole goal here is you really gotta keep your pack light because you're going to be doing that carry over the top. So I think we both weighed in at, uh, at just under 40 pounds, you know, fully wet, if you will, with water and everything for that. Yeah, people say that, um, a comment here is that a, they like that 40 pounds is a light pack. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it was 2013, so I don't know, maybe there's like way better gear now. Uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty light. I mean, you know, just by the time you add up, you guys know, right? It's like you, know, you throw in, yeah, eight ice screws and, you know, pickets and stuff. Like that stuff just, just you can't uh, make metal lighter. <laughs> That's right. That's true because you're running with, um, you know, draws for eight ice screws plus draws for, an, you know, a anchor and things like that too. So you are bringing extra gear. Um, specifically, we both had REI sub kilo sleeping bags, it just so happens. Uh, Gavin mentioned the Black Diamond First Light tent. I think we both had MSR, um, Thermarest, like the, you know, they're super small inflatable sleeping pads. We had one Whippet each, which again is that uh, Black Diamond collapsible trekking pole that has like an ice axe on the end of it, which I enjoy for on the lower angle glacier stuff. So you probably saw in those earlier photos, I don't think either of us had an axe out. I think we both just had a whip it out because the conditions were pretty good. We thought we could see where, you know, danger generally was and it just feel more secure when you have it. Uh, these tools are what Gavin used on it. And I think Gavin, those, those finger rests flick, flick out, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so you can, still... you know, pl plunge, you know, when you need to, when you're on low angle. And then once you get more vertical, you have the, the pinky rest. So yeah, I like these things. Yeah. All right, so from there, uh, I'll cover from here up until at least the top, I think to the top. So this is right where the birch run was, and that's me leading out. And by here, at this point, we had I put on a down coat as well. I think we were both climbing in down coats on top of our um, shells, and uh, the wind was still pretty rough here. You can see there's a party actually above us right here, so we did have to wait at one point to just let make sure we were spaced out well enough. It was very good, like you can see the deep snow, step kicking kind of conditions right through here. And then it zigzag right over here. And this is like a good size crevasse just below me and then a good size crevasse right above me here. And so we could just zigzag right up through that. Um, and then this was the, I think the final pitch of ice that we had that got up to maybe about 70 degrees. And uh, this was probably the most tiring because you're at the highest elevation, you know, you're getting close to 14,000 feet. And I think I had to run out the full length of the rope um, on this one. And I think I put in all, every ice screw I had, and then I just kind of had to run it out as far as I could to get to um, a good spot for the anchor. But um, yeah, it was, I still remember doing that pitch. It was uh, super fun, super tiring, breathing hard, beautiful conditions. Aside from the wind, you can still see the streaks of snow zipping past here. And this was one of the other parties because you can, up above you could kind of, spread out a bit too after you cross the birch run and some could go left a little bit and some could go right. Um, so that was a team that went up to the left. And then here's us on the top with Gavin taking the selfie and glad again we had our goggles on. Uh, you can see we're hood, hoods up and puffies on and everything. And that's where we basically had to uh, 
to crawl a little bit to get over there. And then we were like tired and hungry and we thought maybe we'll have a snack, but it was so windy. We didn't even want to take a snack up there. And so we uh, continued on and dropped down onto the, the Emmons and then took a quick snack break on that side. But uh, so Vic, yeah, Vic, maybe, maybe I should go back and just yeah. stay there for a second. A couple questions here. Um, the latest one, I'll work my way backwards. Once you're committed above the thumb rock, is there an opportunity to bail or do you have to down climb rappel and leave gear behind? Uh, I think you could, you could probably, do, depending on the ice quality, you could set up V threads. And so that's a skill you should know how to do, V or A threads. You could probably do A threads if the ice quality is, is reasonable enough there. Um, but it depends on the alpine ice that you have. Uh, and A thread being a naked V thread, so you're not leaving anything behind. You're speeding your rope through two ice screws that have been put in like that. Uh, there's some good videos online showing how to do that. That would be one way if you had to rappel, but um, some of it's not that steep. You might just have to down climb it if you wanted to go down. Um, that's the, I think that's the toughest part. And that's why in some of the, you know, parties that run into trouble is they, they some have large groups or one person doesn't feel good. And you can imagine like if it's just Gavin and I, and then one person doesn't feel good and we're like halfway up on that face, you know, what do you do? Do you um, just continue moving really slow? Do you try and camp for a bivy for the night someplace and chip a ledge? And, uh, you know, in, on that face, you are exposed. There can be Serac fall and other things that can come from above. And so it's not a place that I would want to hang out very long. Yeah, and I think, and that's what happened, if I remember correctly, you know, a couple of years ago when that guided group Actually, I think, you know, just for whatever reason, actually bivied below one of those Seracs. You know, I think the, the, the theory was that they, or the assessment was, you know, somebody was probably just moving too slowly. They ran out of time, bivied below the Seracs, then something happened, something let loose and basically avalanched them off, um, you know, off the, off the, the face there. So, so, and that kind of actually goes into another question here, which is just, you know, what's the thinking versus, you know, pitching it out versus simul climbing, you know, in terms of exposure to the objective hazards? Yeah, great question. I would say uh, it depends on, so you're trading off security of being anchored firmly to the hill versus um, speed of movement and time in the exposure zone. And so that's, that's the fundamental of the trade-off, I think. The, um, so if you are secured and you are pitching it out, even if someone were to fall, so if you're not as confident on the terrain, um, or the terrain is, be, you know, terrain is beyond your ability, the, the snow quality or the ice quality is really sketchy, um, for whatever reason you pitch it out, like, even if you were to take a fall, uh, you should be, you should be safe um, overall, although you're still falling with a bunch of sharp implements, and you can get hurt in, in that still, versus in a, in a running uh, belay situation, the whole party can generally move faster, because you're, you're just staying uh, maybe two or three ice screws apart. And then you just keep going until the leader runs out of pro. And then you switch leads and keep moving that way. Um, when I climbed the Polish direct route on Aconcagua, which is fairly similar, I'd say, to like a Liberty Ridge, but it starts at 18 and a half thousand feet and goes to 22. Uh, we had really good snow, snow um, step, step kicking conditions. And we, with a team of four, uh, simul climbed the whole thing. And we were running with, with two tools each and kicking deep steps. And we would just put in a minimum of one, maybe two uh, pickets per rope. And then when we ran out of pro, we would kind of pause, bring up the rear you know, of the team, pass the pro back to the leader, and then keep going type of thing. So, yeah. Yep. Good. Okay. Well, uh, thanks, Rick, cool. for answering some of those. But yeah, we can keep going and I'll, I'll keep uh, uh, feathering in the questions awesome. here as we go. Uh, so obviously choosing a partner is super important when you're doing a, a task like this. You know, any time in the mountains, picking a partner is really important. Uh, I don't know if it was Ed Beaster or someone else who said this, where it was like, if you can't get along with someone at sea level, you probably aren't going to get along with them at, you know, 20,000 feet when you're stuck in a tent for several days. Uh, so I, I highly agree if there's anything that rubs someone the wrong way at, uh, at sea level or otherwise, um, it's not a good idea to be stuck in a tent with them. Uh, so you know, Gavin and I have, a, I'd say, a long history. We actually worked together um, when Gavin first moved out to Seattle. And then uh, 
you know, I think both have a, a pretty similar risk tolerance and we both have families and ki little kids and things like that. And so, um, and we're both, I'd say pretty athletic and, and also, um, you know, fairly skilled in the mountains. So I think we make a, a pretty good team in that sense and kind of known capabilities and, and risk tolerance. And, and as Gavin puts here, I think those are all of Gavin's socks and footbeds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> stuck out to dry, to dry man. <laughs> you know, you can dry, dry them on your chest too while you're sleeping. For those of you who don't know, <laughs> that's true. That's true. This looks better though. Yeah. Little decoration. So here, here I am coming up the last little bit to Gavin with my head just down because it's uh, blowing so hard in my face um, as we approach the top, and then we took a brief little snack here. And Gavin, why don't you let folks onto your secret snack? Frozen burritos. Yeah, actually, Woody Fam asked in the chat room, no summit snacky. I'm not sure who Woody Fam is, but anyway, um, the, uh, but yeah, my secret is frozen burritos. So I normally try to get, you know, like the Annie's, you know, nice organic stuff, but I, I think I forgot them or whatever. So we stopped the gas station, got these uh, Jose Ole chimichangas. But what's great about these actually is, I have to say, I learned this trick on this trip was, one, uh, you buy the frozen ones that are fully cooked, so you don't have to worry about, you know, cooking it and raw meat or anything like that, right? And then you can keep them in your pack, and then when you want to eat them that day, you put them in the lid of your pack, especially if it's black in the sun, it gets pretty warm, and it starts to warm up. And uh, so that was a pretty awesome treat on the, on the top when you pulled out one of these and you, you split it with me. Uh, so th <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. That cliff, cliff bar wasn't, wasn't doing it for you, huh? <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> so then here we are starting to head down towards uh, Camp Sherman. Uh, so we were just kind of cutting the corner and, and connecting with the, uh, the Emmons descent route, taking a quick break where the winds were probably only 40 miles an hour on this side. Yeah. And this is actually good. Somebody just asked, did you go to the True Summit? And, and we did not. Our, I think our intent was like, if we can go to the true summit, we will. But at the end of the day, like getting off the mountain, you know, was number one priority. And you can see here, I mean, we were smoked, you know, we were smiling in the other pictures or whatever, but we were pretty, we were pretty tuckered out. And so, you know, we just like here took a little, you know, this little break. <laughs> yeah. And so really, we, so we were like, let's get, da let's just get down. Yeah. We've been to the yeah. summit. So, yeah. So, you know, I mean, it was a, a choice we made. I mean, I think, you know, yeah, you could say, you know, it'd be much, you know, better to go to the, to the very top, but you know, our goal here was to do a cool route and then get back to our families. So yeah. that's why that's the decision we made. It's a long walk too. I think it's like more than a mile or mile and a half or something like that. I have to go back and look at a map, but, uh, it's a long walk. So even, even under good conditions, when you have good visibility, like we had good visibility, the wind was atrocious on the top here. It was in some places crawling to, uh, to stay firm. Uh, it, it would have taken way too long for us to get over to the summit and then come back down. And thankfully we could actually see the descent route. So from where we were, we could drop, we could kind of drop directly to the boot pack. Uh, and there weren't any crevasses that kind of prevented us from doing that at that time. I think we just had to hop over one and I actually dropped my whippet down into it. And then Gavin gave me a little belay and I climbed down into it and was able to mm. rescue my whippet because I, I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are at Sherman and there was a nice tent platform that was someone had dug and flattened out. And we thought about pitching the tent and we just said like, it's not going to rain or snow or anything. And the tent is just going to stick up in the wind and rattle. So why don't we just put our bags out on the ground and just sleep on them. And that worked out pretty well. Yeah, that was nice. And then the next morning we descended early. It was probably the first time I'd ever descended from Sherman early in the morning like that. And it was not fun because <laughs> the ground was all frozen still. And so it was a little bit jarring on your, uh, you know, your feet and ankles, or as I'm used to coming down in late afternoon when it's kind of soft and slushy and, uh, so, uh, Gavin, you want to cover this one? Uh, yeah. So, um, as some of you probably know, um, there are some uh, caves up there, and um, I've seen them on the on the True Summit. And then, actually, um, when I did the Infinity Loop, um, we kind of bumped into one. 
uh, coming down the Emmons. Um, and, uh, and it's just, it's good to know where these things are at, you know, to give you some shelter um, just in case. So um, you can see the, the coordinates here. So thank you for those, uh, Vic. Yeah. And then some of the resources here that we would just wanna call your attention to. So I mentioned already the National Park Service Liberty Ridge Route Guide. So that's what this um, first picture is here. And the Park Service has this for four routes, I think now. They have uh, the Emmons, the Disappointment Cleaver, Liberty Ridge, and I think the Cowitz are the, the four. Um, so you can definitely check them out. It has good data on how many people per year are doing it, how many times, what's the success rate? It's about 50%. Uh, but the um, what months people go in, um, you know, some stories of terrible things that have happened on the routes and things like that. Another that I, you know, two others here to call your attention to would be both from the Mountaineers Press. Um, so that's the, the Mountaineers Books, which is a division of the Mountaineers. So you can support the Mountaineers through buying these books through our website um, or wherever great books are sold. Um, so Mount Rainier, a climbing guide by Mike, Mike Gauthier, who was the uh, chief climbing ranger at Mount Rainier National Park for many years. He's now a uh, park superintendent elsewhere in the system, but a good friend of the Mountaineers. And there is a uh, updated version of that, which has, you know, great full color photos and things like that, uh, that talks you through all the routes. Um, summitpost.com, cascadeclimber.com, the National Park Rangers Blogspot uh, website is another great one, all for trip reports, current conditions. You can kind of get a sense for, it's a great place for doing research to look at how do people's experiences on a route vary uh, based on the way conditions are and based on that person's prior experience things. And then uh, some alpinism here. So I, I guess if you wanna get even better at this, you can, you can read this book. And I think that's, that's about it. So from here, we'll just kind of open it up to, to questions. I'll stop sharing the screen. And if anyone wants to uh, drop yeah, in, big, yeah, I'll ask, yeah, yeah. I'll let me let me just ask. Or uh, I got some in the in the chat room. I'm moderating my first time. It's exciting. Um, first of all, is the full recording going to be shared today? The recording and the PowerPoint. I think so, right? Yes. Uh, Sky Story here says full recording today will be posted after the talk on the event page. Great. Another comment here. Why wasn't Freedom of the Hills listed as a resource? Oh, yes. Freedom well, be that is an sure. assumption. I mean, if you haven't read yeah. Freedom of the Hills, like you can't <laughs> even like, yeah. Yeah, obviously Freedom of the Hills. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, here's car. a good one. You know, car to car. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, um, I mean, it's been done. I don't know, lots, but definitely done car to car. Yeah, I think uh, 24 hours or so has been what I feel like is like a, a a reasonable time for people doing car to car maybe on Liberty Ridge. It really is condition dependent. Um, and I, I there's also been some FKTs on it too, where I think uh, Colin Haley may hold for like running in AT boots up to the base and, you know, skiing up to the base, then getting to the summit and then ski bombing down the Emmons or something like that. So uh, it's certainly possible. It's also just like, it, you know, in some of these like, um, yeah, fun to squeeze things in like that car to car. Also sometimes fun to just hang out in cool places. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually another question is, you know, rock fall at Thumb Rock. Um, uh, it says now that it's being reported to be a shooting gallery, are there alternate bivy sites on the route? It's interesting. I don't, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't honestly kept, you know, um, uh, track of that, but you know, it was, it's historically been the good place for the bivy just because it is protected, um, you know, a more protected site, but that may have been changing, right. As we see glacier melt. Yeah. This last year there were, um, in addition to the, the party that was helicoptered off um, after several days, you know, they were helicoptered off, I think, off of the, near the summit, but they were stuck on the route for a few days, and then they ended up in, you know, at um, Harbor View here and stuff for frostbite and stuff. Um, 
I'm not sure exactly what led to them getting stuck in the beginning, but I think there's something had like a tent blow away and they had a person who had some altitude issues and stuff. There was another party yeah. like the week before where there was a fatality um, from the Thumb Rock area from Rockfall. And so that was a group where they were in the right, you know, in the right, what we deem the right place, if you will, um, at the right time. So it was no fault of their own. It's just that the hazard of, of being in a, rocky place and I think after that incident uh, some of the guide groups canceled their their trips on the route because of that so I, I haven't checked this year to see obviously people aren't climbing this year because of COVID and stuff but the uh, if guide services are still thinking about leading the route or not I think some other groups have thought about just camping out on the carbon um, you know out of the uh, out of the way and then just doing the whole thing uh, to the summit yeah, there you go. Someone just um, part and placed everyone. People are climbing the ridge from the bottom of the ridge to the summit on summit day. Yeah. Got it. There you go. FKT, seven hours. Go for it. Nice. Uh, what else? Ba, 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 ba. Oh, is there a reason you didn't attempt to ski down? Well, we would have had to carry skis. So that would have been another, like, I don't know, 20 pounds of gear to carry up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like. I don't know. Maybe now. I mean, this was. I mean, again, this was. You know, a, a while back, and um, you know, even you know, I've gotten lighter gear and things like that. Um, uh, but maybe now I actually would do it that way, just because you know I, you know, I like to climb in my ski boots and everything, and you know, it wouldn't have been that much more weight you know, just to get off the Emmons. The challenge though was, I think it's, you know, the Emmons is, you know, broken up to begin with. And, you know, this is relatively, you know, later in the season. Um, so you, basically you would just want to make sure that if you're going to do it, you would have, a, you know, a, a, it would be worthwhile to ski the Emmons. Yeah. So either maybe you've, you, maybe you just did the Emmons like a day or two before, and then you know the ski descent is good. Yep. Um, and that way you know where it's safe to descend and stuff too. Yeah. Can you give another breakdown, White River to Camp One, Thub Rock? Okay, so uh, let's we see. We have it on that first, we want to go back to, I think that's okay. one of those first slides. Yeah, let me reload the slides here and see if I can get back to the um, thing. But I think it was basically, we started climbing at like four in the afternoon, because I think we left kind of after work from downtown Seattle. And we wanted to get there when the ranger station was still open. And then we hiked up here. Okay, let me present and screen share again. Hang on. Got to do the screen share first. Not as pro as Gavin yet on this. That's what I've always wanted to be good at. This is Zoom <laughs> video conferencing. Okay. Can you guys see it now? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Friday, we started out of White River. Uh, it was actually the time like walking out of the car. And, and then we kind of just went up until we thought, okay, the sun's getting close to going down. And then we dug that little bomb shelter out on the glacier because we knew that it wasn't going to be a long day to get to Thumb Rock. And so that's another option for people is if you're going to get to White River early in the morning, on a Friday or a Saturday or whatever day, um, and you're gonna actually gonna start walking from your car at like 11 a.m. or 10 a.m. or something like that after being all geared up and checking out, you can probably get to Thumb Rock no problem um, if you were gonna camp at Thumb Rock, or you could get to like the bottom of the bottom of the ridge if you wanted to be out of the way. Now you you need to be a long ways out from the bottom of the ridge because stuff can come thundering down the Liberty Wall and Willis Wall. Um, and Rockfall can come off that ridge quite a ways too. So I'd be careful on, on camping near the bottom. But so you could combine what we did in day one and two into one day potentially. Yeah, because you can see, I mean, we got there early. I didn't realize we got there at 9 a.m. to it was really early. I remember just hanging you know, out for like 12 hours being like, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's where, yeah. But, you know, we wanted to give our, we were just trying to be conservative and want to give ourselves plenty of time. We didn't know navigating the car hard it would be to get on you know on uh, from the toe of the ridge but yeah it was actually straightforward yeah 
And I think if I was to you know do it again based on knowing the conditions better, I just would have left earlier probably uh, on Sunday rather than 2 a.m. You know, go at midnight or something like that. But it ended up working out fine for what we did. If you, you know, we didn't have a reservation to camp at Sherman, uh, but it's not like they're going to come and kick you out <laughs> at 10 p.m. when you're just sleeping in a sleeping bag on the snow. So. Other questions? Yeah. Any other questions out there? Some gear questions. What size diameter rope did we use? Uh, I forget what exactly it was. I mean, it was a you know lightweight uh, climbing rope, but it was yeah. but it was full strength. It wasn't a it wasn't a um, a glacier rope. Um, but yeah, full sixty meter climbing rope. No, it wasn't part of the infinity loop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's next next level. What was the quality of the ice? Uh, I would say it varied dramatically. We had some places where it was um, just kind of like windblown snow, um, glacier ice. And then it was, in other places, it was like polished, uh, kind of almost like water ice. Uh, but not as good as, as waterfall ice. Uh, so in some places we could get pretty good, pretty what seemed like pretty good quality screws in, and in other places it was it was a picket, um, or it was break the surface kind of plate of ice off, and then and then maybe you can get a picket or a screw in or something like that. But it did vary dramatically. First meal you had afterwards. Hmm. We, we had to have stopped somewhere. Yeah, I, don't I don't know. know. I feel like I think you had to go to work, didn't you? I probably. I think that's <laughs> my, my that's my style. Just roll right in. Yeah. Luckily, I don't have to really do my hair, so I just kind of kind of get get away with that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Oh, what would you do differently if you went up again? No, oh, that's a good question. Yeah, good question. You know, it's interesting because Gavin and I, we've both been interviewed by the news when those recent accidents had happened, you know, in 2014 when the Alpine Ascents team of six was killed. And then just this last year, I was interviewed two or three times. Um, and sometimes they always ask you the question is like, oh, would you do it again? Um, you know, knowing now what can happen. And uh, I, I always find it kind of a silly question because if you say, you um, oh, no, I wouldn't do it. That means you were kind of an idiot the first time and you had no idea what you were getting into and you hadn't properly thought through the risks. Um, and if you say yes to some people, it, it appears you're totally insensitive to people that just had someone die on the route. And um, so, I, like, I, but I view it as actually, like, you know, yes is the right answer unless my risk tolerance somehow has changed because of my life circumstances or because the route has inherently become more dangerous than, than what it was when I did it previously. And both of those things could, could be true, but you know, I think both of us went in uh, you know, knowing about the conditions and tried to manage that as, as best we could given our, our risk profiles and things. I think in terms of things I would do differently, um, you know, I, I would probably bring a better meal because that one meal was terrible that I had to <laughs> kind of work on. And then uh, we definitely would both bring our inreaches this time. So we'd have two-way messaging. And I think now, you know, Gavin and I are probably both way better ice climbers than we were at the time. Because um, we both have gone up to, to Canmore and climbed with Steve Swenson up there uh, one year at least uh, for Gavin and I together. And then I've gone up a few more years. But uh, so now we can definitely, um, you know, simul, I think, a lot more of that. So we could probably even be faster in the, in the danger zone. Anything you'd add, add, Gavin? Yeah, I think that's um, that's all uh, correct. I think you would just we already talked about some of the timing stuff. Like we could probably just cut out one of the overnights, yeah. right? Because we left, you know, we could have left um, on Saturday morning and you know gotten in there. But I think part of it too, we wanted to get to the ranger station to actually get a permit. Um, 
and you know and and we're also working right so it was just kind of a constraint you know of just our you know current situation you know that year for was like a meal right and a little part of extra fuel um so i guess that would have been the big change uh there was a question here about did you set any particular physical conditioning goals beforehand or did you just hike and climb like crazy to get in the best possible shape you know i would say like um uh, having having done the seven summits and like knowing what it takes to do those types of things i, I could kind of hear more about the um, like I kind of knew what type of condition I was in versus what I would feel is good enough for it. And so I know, you know, like Gavin also sets crazy audacious goals for himself in terms of fitness. And so uh, like, I think, I think we did a, did we climb and ski granite was one of our training ones we did together, Gavin? Probably. Yeah. I think that's right. We carried, I think we carried like a heavy pack of granite as like a conditioner together because we didn't have a whole lot of time to do training together. And then yep. we um, just skied from the summit of, of granite kind of, and it was late season, so there weren't that many turns, but it just required us to carry heavy stuff for a long time. Yeah, but I think it's just, you know, like cumulative years of experience just on, you know, experience on big mountains, you know, and in addition to the physical component, right? Because you could be in great shape and do, you know, people ask like, what's your time on mailbox? Like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about long, you know, you know, long days with heavy packs. Like that's what you should be aspiring to. Yeah. Were you ever severely scared on the route? I don't think on this route I was scared. I was, when I, we got to Sherman, my toes were so cold just because we'd been front pointing for all mm. day. And so I remember that they were, they were pretty, pretty cold. Okay. Curious about, to hear more about the crossing the Shrund. Um, obvious crux on the route. Typically it is. I didn't think it was the crux for us on our day because I feel like we could just kind of um, S around most of it. It looked like it might separate in a few, you know, week or two more or something like that uh, where the birch run was fracturing, but we were kind of able to just kind of S around it. What was the steepest portion of ice was right after that. Um, and so that was the, the photo that Gavin took from below that just showed like the bottoms of my boots completely because I was front pointing on that. How do we stay in shape <laughs> for big climbs? Well, Gavin doesn't sleep. That's how, what I think. <laughs> he drinks coffee. <laughs> um, you want to say how you stay in shape, Gavin? Like what do you, what's your routine? Yeah, I mean, I, I look I just I'm trying to do it's hard, right? I mean, family work of full. You know, I think it is just trying to be active in some regard. Like this morning, I ran a little bit, and then I biked for 45 minutes this, this afternoon. I mean, I got a two, you know, a double in, but they were very short. You know, just to try to do something. So, you know, that's one thing why I like running, just because like I can do it, you know, in the dark in the rain by myself you know and it's a little bit sad honestly but you know that's why you know i can get to tiger mountain here and, and you know 10 minutes and go up cable line and it's just it's just right here so it's just easy whereas you know skiing you want to go with a partner and you want to go when it's light and it's just more fun when it's not raining um even though i know rob stevenson's on and we've done plenty of ski you know dawn patrols in the with in the rain but um, you know, same thing with climbing, right? You got to, you know, it's better when it's light and, you know, you got to have a partner and, you know, it's not good in the rain. So, you know, that's why I just gravitate towards, towards running um, and, and biking. So just trying to be active um, and be multidisciplinary, I think is just healthy. Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, you know, two things that uh, I've done since having kids that have shifted in the way that I train, I'd say one is, uh, my training tends to be a lot earlier in the morning, so I tend to wake up, um, you know, like if the kids are waking up at seven, I'll be waking up somewhere between five and six in the morning, depending on how long of a workout I want to get in. And then uh, I live in a high-rise condo in downtown Seattle, so I don't have quite the access that Gavin has to the trails. So if it's summertime and I have visibility, I'm not a big fan of running in the dark in the city because of cars and things like that right now, but maybe I'll get there. Um, 
uh, is I'll, you know, so if it's light out, I'll go and run. But if um, I will, uh, you know, go up to the gym in my in my building or right now, since the gym is even closed because of COVID, uh, I'm in the stairwell in my building and not touching anything. And so I've got a, a weighted pack sitting right there in my closet that I just that I just pull on and just uh, and just kind of go do the stairs and listen to an audiobook for for an hour while I while I do a couple hundred flights of stairs type of thing. Um, OK. Another party ahead of you influence your line. Yes, it did. I recall having the conversation when we were at Belay together to kind of like, since the wind was blowing typically, I feel like from our right to our left, um, we also tried to stay to the right of the party. That way, anything they were kicking down, hopefully with the strong winds, would get blown clear of us to the left-hand side as well. Um, it's not as bad, though, as on waterfall ice climbs where you just don't climb below someone else at all. Um, Oh yeah, how do you stay in shape with COVID and the stay-at-home order? So I think I, maybe I covered that now because I'm doing stairs in my building. Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be pretty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you guys mentioned it was quite windy, and given the steepness of the route, how did you communicate? Yeah, we didn't have radios, and I think the radios would have probably just picked up a ton of wind. It would have been really hard to hear anyway. I recall uh, using big arm gestures like waving for you to come up once I had you on, um, you know, on anchor, that type of thing. Yeah. But videos are a great idea, you know, in other, on other routes. So it's, it's, you know, they're so light and, and, and small that um, I highly suggest them, you know, if you're um, going to, you know, be in, like on a complicated rock route, um, they're, they're great. Yeah, absolutely. I've used it on a rock route before we were on, um, north early winter or sorry south early winter spire and observed a leader fall of another party on north early winter spire and uh we left part of our we had, we had enough people to be in like two three or three teams or something like that and left one team on the top the other two teams went down and even another leader went up but we had radios to communicate back to our own team because the person on the top could shout across to the to the patient and we could then communicate back up to them while we were climbing up their route to start initiating a rescue. And then we additionally were able to, on the general like one one channel, um, just try and put out a mayday for help because it looked like we were going to need help. And this is before in reaches and stuff. Uh, and it just so happened there was a trail run that was happening nearby that had medics. And the medics were able to like respond within two hours or something like that. And we were able to get a helicopter to bring that person out. Uh, other 50 classic climbs. I don't think I have actually. I'd have to go look at the list. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah, my yeah there's climbing, so many good ones. Yeah, my climbing from uh, Seven Summits then shifted to uh, multi-pitch rock and I've done a number of trips to Red Rock with like groups of four or five folks and, and doing whether it's cragging or long, long days there, super fun place to go, uh, super accessible from the car. And then, uh, and meanwhile, you can have a hot tub and a, you know, a nice dinner in the evening. And then the other is going up to Canmore in the winter and uh, do it, trying to do a, a waterfall ice climbing trip there of uh, four or five days or something. Cool. All right. Well, it's good timing. Uh, yeah. Hour fifteen. Thanks, everybody. Um, we'll we'll get this link out, and oh, let, I um, will also post a link to the uh, slides and stuff too. And uh, again, feel free. Please send that feedback form in when you get one, uh, because we'd love to see like if you have recommendations on on other topics you would love to have in this kind of beta and bruise segment. If this to work, we'll we'll try and get those arranged. We got tons of people in the community who I think would be would be stoked to share their stuff with you. Definitely. All right. Good night, everybody. Awesome. All right, guys. Stay, stay safe out there.